Anyone who's obligated to eat matzah is obligated to eat a kazaid. A kazaid is a minimum amount. We have to see what a kazaid is exactly to, just to make sure that we understand. I heard the most fascinating story um, from Rabosha Weiss told over a story about a, uh, a chosid who during, during the Holocaust in the, uh, in the ghetto in Warsaw uh, was attacked by the Nazis and beaten up just before Pesach. Um, and they, they sma actually, they smashed him pretty badly and they smashed out his teeth. And uh, he was left, you know, in a, a state of, of, of great pain and disrepair as well. And uh, he came to, I think it was Rav Menachem Ziemba, who was the, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest Hamdei Chachomim in, uh, in the ghetto at the time. And uh, he was very upset, very upset. And you can imagine, right? So Raziemba was sure that, uh, that this fellow was going to come and complain, why does God do this to me? What's going on? And uh, so the only thing he came and he asked was that he says, how, I, how on earth am I going to be able to fulfill the mitzvah of eating matzah on, on Pesach? They, they knocked out all my teeth. So uh, Raziemba told him, he said he gave him permission to grind up the matzah into, make, turn it into as small pieces as possible. He said them to eat it together with water, to, to wash it down. And that's a big thing where the Hasidim, that's a big thing, because they don't eat what's called brok, gebrok. They don't eat matzah that's been mixed with liquid. And uh, he said that, uh, Rav Zimba said that this fellow left in tears over the fact that he was going to have to fulfill the mitzvah his entire life. He'd never eaten matzah that was mixed together with liquid, and now he's going to have to do it in order to fulfill the mitzvah. And it's like, Rav Zimba, it may, this all may sound to us very, very detailed, very, very... You know, I don't, I don't know, like, sort of like too detailed. Like, does it really make any difference how much matzah we're going to eat? It's going to be like this amount and not that amount. And what difference does it make? But Lamaisa, this is, this is how we're going to fulfill the mitzvah, right? Judaism is a very, a very exact religion. It's a very detailed religion. And uh, it's inconceivable that you should be able to eat, there's a, a mitzvah to eat matzah on Pesach, and it's not going to tell you how much matzah you need to eat. What's the minimum? So let's have a look. We, we are going to use the rulings of the Chazanish, just to explain, there are three basic approaches to Shi'urim, they're called Shi'urim, which is sizes. The, uh, the most stringent is the Chazanish, that's who was considered to be the halachic authority in Israel, they lived in the 50s over here. Um, there's a medium, um, uh, like an, uh, sort of like a medium size, and that's Rav Moshe Feinstein, and then there's the smallest size of all, which is Rav Chaim Noy. Where is this coming from? The disagreement, where is it coming from? It's coming from a sort of like a, a, some, a somewhat vague definition of how much these amounts are supposed to be. Right? It's, each one has got their own definition of how much a kazayat is. Right? And uh, so what we're going to use is we're going to use the, the measurements of the Chazan Ish. It's true that they are going to be larger than the other measurements, but on the other hand, that way, at least we know that we've covered our bases over here. So, uh, the Orisa, Torah obligation for fulfilling <coughs> the mitzvah of eating a kazais is going to be a half of a hand matzah or two-thirds of a machine matzah. Right? Now, hand matzahs are bigger than machine matzahs. <coughs> Yesterday we spoke about the idea that machine matzahs are square and hand matzahs are round and the hand matzahs are normally considerably, considerably bigger. The best way of describing uh, half of a hand matzah size-wise is to say that it's about half of a hand size matzah. That's what I think. Um, that's about the most accurate way of describing it. If you want to describe it in watermelon terms, then please feel free to do so. But of course, it does depend on the size of the watermelon. watermelon yeah. <laughs> um, and, and where you cut it, of course. In, in watermelon, it's not round. It's, uh, it's more of an ovoid say, a shape. In all events, um, the hand matzahs are bigger Machine matzahs are smaller. That means you've got to eat more of a machine matzah in order to fulfill the mitzvah. That's all, right? So it's two thirds of a machine matzah and half of a hand matzah. The rabbonin, a rabbinical obligation, so it's going to be less. At the rabbonin, so we we're going to be a little bit less stringent, right? There's room for a little bit of, of flexibility, a little bit of leniency, and that means that in order to fill a the rabbonin, which is a rabbinical. A rabbinical obligation, which is definitely the koirach, that's definitely the uh, sandwich that Hillel makes using the matzah and the mora. For that, you need a quarter of a hand matzah and a third of a machine matzah. 
Uh, I mean, the truth, look, you know, the truth of the matter is that this, this uh, Korach, this, this sandwich that Hillel ate, it doesn't have to be a sandwich. You don't, you don't have to, put you know, together. Put, the, put, put the mora in between two pieces of matzah. Mm. It's just the easiest way to eat it. Yeah, yeah. But you could just put the mora on top of the matzah and eat it like that. You don't have to have a, a, another piece on the top. Mm. Uh, so now we've worked out how much matzah you're supposed to eat. The question is within how much time you're supposed to eat it. Right? Everything's got a time frame. Um, there's something in the halacha called kadeh. Achilas pras. Kedei achilat pras. What is that? Kedei achilat pras is the amount of time that it would take you to eat a kazais of food, a kazais of bread. Right, now how long is that? So for a diorisa, it's going to be two minutes. Now, that may sound okay to you, but it's, it's actually, it's quite, a, it's quite an avoider to take the kazais of matzah and to, you've got to eat it and swallow it all within two minutes. Right? Matzah is not an easy thing to swallow. Water. You can wash it down with water, but if you're washing it down with water, of course, it's, going to, it's just going to take longer to... Uh, I don't, we're not even going to discuss over here the opinion of the briskarov, which is that the kazais of matzah needs to be eaten in one go and swallowed in one go. We're, we're not going to talk about that, because if you do that, you may never do anything ever again. Um, <laughs> but at least you'll, you'll have... You know, at least you, you'll have Made it up. You'll have made it upstairs in the middle of a mitzvah, which is probably uh, the best way to go, right? Uh, the Gemara says that one. I can't remember. One of the Tanoim said that that's how. Yeah, that's how he wants to die in the, in the process of doing a mitzvah. Um, so the Mefarshim asks, "What do you mean the process? Why why not having just fulfilled the mitzvah? Surely that's the way to go." And they say, "No, that the best way to go is really in the in the midst of the mitzvah itself." Um, I'm, again, I'm not suggesting anything over here. Um, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> Mitz Hashem, you can, you, can, you can push that off for a long time in Mitz Hashem. Uh, in all events, for a Diorisa, two minutes. For a Dirabonon, for a Rabbinical Mitzvah, we've got much more time, up to nine minutes. Wow. So again, what have we got over here? We've got for the first Moitzi Matzah, you're going to have to eat a half, of a, a half of a hand Matzah in two minutes, or two-thirds of a machine Matzah in two minutes. For the Koirech, which is the sandwich together with the mora, so you can eat a quarter of a hand matzah or a third of a machine matzah, yeah, within nine minutes. You've got much more time to be able to do it in. There is a custom that some people have not to eat matzah before Pesach. The question is from when? So some people have a custom not to eat matzah from Purim, a whole month before. They don't eat anything that's got matzah, so that would include kneilach and... Uh, uh, you know, yeah. any, anything, anything that's got matzah inside of it. Why you know what? Let's start at the beginning. The the, uh, the the Indian is you're not you're not allowed. No one is allowed to eat matzah on erev Pesach. Mm -hmm. uh, which means that when we go into Pesach, we're supposed to be eating the matzah. This is going to be the first time we've eaten it at least that day. Mm -hmm. We're going to eat it with an appetite, and it's going to be something special. Some people have taken that further, and they said, okay, you know what? Obviously, if you're not supposed to eat the matzah on the day before Pesach. So obviously there's an Indian over here of not eating matzah in order to have an anticipation and excitement about eating it. So some people have the custom not to eat a month before. Some people have the custom not to eat from Rosh Chodesh, which is two weeks before. And the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the minig of Anshe Lita, the Lithuanian minag, is just to do as the halacha says and not to eat matzah and from the day before Pesach until the night of Pesach. Uh, whatever you do, it just really depends on your on your minig, right? Your family minig, your community minig. Um, by the Hasidim, uh, that's a big thing. They normally stop a month before. Um, I must admit that in, in my family, uh, we didn't we didn't stop. I mean, we didn't eat very much matzah to begin with, actually, except for on Pesach. It was a very it was a it, it's a very economical food because on top of everything else, it doesn't go stale, which means yeah. that you know you can bake a batch of it, and then you just you've got it. It's just there. Um, but uh, the the idea of of not eating on air of Pesach is that when we come to eat it on Pesach itself, we're going to make a bracha of al achilat matzah, right? And it should be something new. Should something, you know, something new, something fresh. So Friday, you're not supposed to eat. I mean, so Thursday night, from so Thursday night, night, for the people who hold according to the Lithuanian custom, minag lita, so they should, uh, they should stop eating matzahs only from the night before, right, on Yudalev from Badika's Chomet onwards. They shouldn't be eating matzah. For everybody else, again, follow... 
follow your family minig, follow your family custom, follow your community custom. Um, like I mentioned before, by the Hasidim, they tend to they tend to stop eating a lot before everybody else does. And, and whatever you, whatever you do, it's absolutely fine, really. Uh, you know, the only thing that a Kodesh Baruch Hu can pin on you when you get upstairs at the age of 120 is that you ate matzah after Rosh Chodesh Nisan, then you're in pretty good shape, I reckon. <laughs> Matza, <laughs> matzah ashira you can eat because that's not considered to be the matzah of Pesach. No, I don't mean that. I mean, you know, today we eat matzahs that have to be kosher. We know where they come from. We receive on the boxes for Pesach. Not matzahs that were made for poor people yeah. that are called matzahs because the, all they are is, uh, yeah. is flour and, 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 and... No, so all, all matzah... All matzah Right? It's just to stop eating all matzah, regardless of when it was made and regardless of why it was made as well. There is, in the market, I mentioned the other day, there is matzah, which is chomed stick. Right? What is, what is, what is chomed stick matzah? It can't be used on Pesach, obviously, but what is chomed stick matzah? Because the flour that's being used is flour that's not been supervised. Okay. It's flour that's been through a sister, it's been, it's been through a production, and uh, it's not, it's, it's no, harvest stick, it's leavened, it's written and, on the and box, it's the has to be. The exactly the same, it tastes okay. exactly the same, it looks exactly the same. Uh, the truth of the matter is, even matzah ashira looks the same as other matzah, it may taste different, right? The matzah ashira, if you remember, is the yeah. matzah with the egg in it or with the, with the juice yeah. in it. Uh, that kind of matzah you can use without any problem whatsoever, even on your dollar, which means if you're a matzah fiend, which, which uh, I mean, I don't really know you well enough to say, but I would say half of that is true. And the minig is not to eat for a month before, so just use matzah ashira. That's okay. That's not considered to be matzah. Even though it looks like matzah, it's not considered to be matzah. Again, one of the definitions of matzah is lechem oini, like we spoke about. First time I'm hearing that people eat matzah for no other reason. My, my wife's... Like <laughs> my, my wife's uncle. Yes, you imagine that most people don't eat matzah because they have to. Uh, my wife's uncle loved matzah. Loved it, and he uh, he he would he would make hamotzi on matzah. You know, given the choice, he would make hamotzi of a matzah, and he certainly made hamotzi on shalashudas always on matzah. And they used to buy lots of the stuff at Pesach and just keep it through the year. Uh, okay. um, you know, but that was his particular thing. The uh, you actually I'll tell you I'll tell you a fascinating story about him. He he was a very from man, um, and he actually created he invented the first nuclear submarine, <laughs> together with Admiral Rickover. They were partners. They were working for the American government. And uh, they, he, he invented the first nuclear submarine. And he told me, he was a nuclear physicist, afterwards he came on Aliyah, and he lived over here in Israel, and he worked in Be'er Sheva University and Tel Aviv University on, the, uh, on, on things that uh, apparently Israel doesn't have, so I'm not quite sure what he was working on. Um, glow, oh, glow-in-the-dark watch faces, perhaps. Oh. Uh, maybe that's why they needed the uranium. Something like that, anyway. Um, and he told me that every single bit of research that he ever did in the laboratory brought him closer to Hashem. Mm -hmm. Nuclear physics is a fascinating thing. You know, the idea of breaking things down smaller and smaller and smaller and then imagining that you've got to the smallest and then breaking the atom and then going further and further and where they're holding now by quarks or something. I, I think at some point they're going to have to stop because they can't think of any more silly names. But uh, in, the me in the meantime, uh, so I said to him, that's interesting. I said, but what about Admiral Rickover? Admiral Rickover was Jewish. He just, he, w he happened to be completely assimilated. He was married, believe it or not, he was married to a, a from Roman Catholic woman. Anyway, so I, I asked my wife's uncle, I said to him, okay, you know, if every bit of research brought you closer to Hashem, so what about Rikova? What happened to him? So he said, well, every single bit of research that Rikova ever did brought him closer to the next bit of research. Yeah. He, looked at, he looked at, you know, science as being a be-all to an end-all, and uh, that, that, was his, that was his passion. Um, and, and like I said, you know, they, they, between them they created something which was truly uh, an, astonishing, an astonishing concept. The idea of, of uh, having a submarine that can run on a nuclear engine that's going to stay underwater for months and months and be almost undetectable. Uh, <coughs> right, we're done with Matza. Let's have a look at Mara. Let's see what we've got over here. So in the, the Pesach says, Al Matzois Omorim Yechluhu. Right, that we have to eat Matza Omorah on Pesach night. However, in order for the Mara to be a Diorite, in order for it to be a Torah obligation, we have to eat it together with the Korban Pesach, with the Pesach offering. Now, we don't have a temple right now. It's a shed. Maybe before Pesach everything will be taken care of, and we will have, right? If you yeah, people just don't... They have a Chinese laborer, apparently. <laughs> they do things very quickly. The, the, uh, the, uh, 
the the uh, it's got to be in order for the bar to be a deal, right? So it's got to be eaten with the korban pesach. It's got to be eaten with the, with the pesach offering. That means that unless all of you do tshuva right now, it could be that on pesach the mitzvah of eating the mara is only going to be a rabbinical mitzvah and not a torah mitzvah. What is mara? Right. So mara the the simple um, the simple translation of the word mara is bitter herbs. Right? The word mar means something which is bitter. <coughs> um, the, the, uh, the Gemara lists five different possibilities of what can be used as moror. And the, interesting enough, the least desirable choice is the most obvious choice, which is what's called tamcha. Tamcha is horseradish. Accepted that like the best choice is lettuce, believe it or not. And the least choice because is actually chazeret? <coughs> yeah, tamche. Why? Uh, we're, here, we're going to talk about it in a minute. Let's have a look and see. Um, so, not just any old lettuce, but romaine lettuce. You'll see in a minute why, what no the difference is. Right. Which are the great big leafy, right. like the great big leafy leaves of lettuce. Mm -hmm. well, what's the big deal about that? It's the most incredible idea. Rav Moshe Feinstein explains like this. Really the most like, extraordinary idea. Romaine, ro, ro, romaine, ro, romaine. That dark green leafy lettuce is, when you start eating it, it's sweet. Mm. You, you would have actually thought it's the absolute opposite of what you would need to eat yeah. to fulfill the mitzvah of Mara, right? And yet, what happens, says Rav Moshe Feinstein, if you keep eating it, keep chewing it, yeah, it becomes sure. bitter. Right. I never wait for that. Oh, so here, that's what you've got to do on, on Seder night. You've got to mm. chew and chew, and it represents what happened in Egypt. Mm -hmm. When we went down to Egypt, Yaakov went down to Egypt together with the, with the sons, right? And they set up their dwelling over there, and they lived. The truth is that for 17 years that Yaakov was still alive, they lived like kings over there. They lived, they had everything. They lived a life, it was truly a life of luxury. After Yaakov died, it wasn't quite as good. After the brothers died, Yosef died first, and then the other brothers died, and then things started getting worse and worse, and that, that's when the terrible slavery started taking place. Says Rav Moshe Feinstein, the Indian of eating moror is not just to remember that things were bitter in Egypt, but to remember how things got bitter in Egypt. They started off sweet. They started off good. That's what it tells you. Oh, so what's, what's the problem with horseradish? <laughs> The problem with the horseradish is that it's bitter immediately. You don't, you don't get that, you don't get that, that build-up to reach the bitterness to understand what was happening over there. So before we go any further, I know this is not, not to do with the halachas of Moro, but there's a most incredible, most incredible lesson over here, something which is absolutely vital to understanding what the concept of exile really is. Yaakov Avinu lived for 17 years in Egypt he lived like a king, and that's part of the exile. After he met his son. After he met Yosef, right? Yitzchok, who lived before Yaakov, Yitzchok, from the, the 400 years accounted for the birth of Yitzchok. 400 years of, 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 uh, of being in Golis, of being in exile, right? Yitzchok never left the land of Israel. And yet, the amount of time that he was there is included inside of the 400 years. So the rabbis explain something very, very important over here. Exile is not a state of being, it's a state of mind. If we understand that we're in exile, then we can live <coughs> anywhere in comfort, and it's going to be okay, right? So for example, Yitzhak Avinu can live in Israel, and it's part of the exile because he knows that this is not the way it's supposed to be yet. Yaakov Avinu can live like a king in Egypt, and it's part of the exile because he knows the whole time that this is not where he's supposed to be. When does the physical, when does it become physical? When does it start becoming nasty? When does it start becoming bitter? Joseph. Only when we start losing sight of the fact that this is not the way that it's supposed to be. What is, is there any deep insight into this, this, the fact that when Yosef died... Then things started getting Yes, better. very much Suddenly, so. He was such a tzaddik that after... Uh, like Yo Yosef, Yosef is a glue. Yeah, pretty much. 
Yosef is the glue that holds the Jewish people together and keeps them pointed in the right direction. When Yosef is no longer around, so all of a sudden, it's like, here we are. This is where we're supposed to be. And I'll tell you, it's an interesting thing. You can go back into the writings of the early authorities, what are called the Rishonim, and you'll see among some of them, they, they, they talk, they, they, they decry the, the, uh, the uh, enormous houses that people are busy building themselves, Jews are busy building themselves in the communities that they live in outside of Israel. And he says that these, these people have lost sight of what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Which means, right? what, Which means that when a, person, coming to oh, when a person builds himself a beautiful mansion, what is that person really saying? I'm here. This is, this is where I am, right? This is where I'm going to be. And that's not, a, that's, not a great, that's not a great state of mind to be in. That's not healthy for the Jewish people. I've met over the years very few, very wealthy people who do not buy, they don't own their own homes outside of Israel. They'll rent. They may rent beautiful places. But the fact that they're renting is for them an indication. That means, you know, well, in Mitzvah Hashem, we're going to get to Israel. The Mashiach is going to come. We're going to leave it all behind. It's going to be great. It's going to be fine. So you hear the, the idea of the, of the lettuce, of the, apparently the Romaine lettuce, is that it starts off sweet and then it gets bitter. And that's what we, that's the whole, you know, in a sense, that's like the essence of, of Jewish history is that we, we never learn anything from what's going on. We never pay any attention. So we get thrown out of one country and we go off to the next country and over a few generations we start establishing ourselves, establishing ourselves and just becoming, you know, more and more established. The wandering Jew. The wandering Jew, right? <laughs> wondering why it is that we're wondering, I guess. Well, What's wrong with an o and a. By the way, interestingly enough, horseradish, for those of you who are not familiar with it, horseradish is when you grate it, <coughs> it becomes, it's, it's incredibly it powerful. But if you leave it for a while, then the it, it start yeah it, it starts to die down the uh, the the uh, the intensity, and that's why interestingly enough the uh, in the halacha it says that if you're gonna if you are gonna use horseradish you should grate the horseradish just before the seder, and not grate it in the afternoon at some point right but in the olden days you couldn't do that so they say that you should you should grate the horseradish just before the seder that it should have a potency to it that it wouldn't have otherwise. Um, in all events, how much? So a kazayas. A kazayas. How much is a kazayas? Okay, so here we go. For romaine lettuce, with the emphasis on the O. Oh. Um, we're talking about enough leaves to be 8 by 10 inches. Or 20, 20 and a half centimeters by 25 and a half centimeters. Uh, 8 by 10 inches, right? which is just take, take a bunch of leaves, put them together. Normally, if, you, if you've got sort of biggish leaves, it's like two, maybe two. Uh, it's it's going to be enough for you to be able to fulfill the mitzvah of eating the horseradish. Uh, so the, sorry, the lettuce. If you're using horseradish, so it's 32 milliliters. 11.1 fluid ounces for anybody here who doesn't understand milliliters. Um, so it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an amount, right? In horseradish terms, it's quite an amount. Uh, who's obligated with a mitzvah of Mara? Everybody. Anyway, let's, let's finish with a little story. I told this story over at the, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, thing that we had a couple of weeks ago, but it's a cute story, so I want to tell it again. My, uh, my, uh, many, many years ago, decades ago, uh, in the area that we lived in, a non-Jewish family opened up a green grocery store. Fruits and vegetables. And uh, it was a couple of weeks before Pesach, and my mother, uh, my mother believed that it was, a, it was like a mitzvah to go and support the local stores. So she, uh, she, told, she told all her friends they should go and make their Pesach orders by this fellow. So off everybody went. Now, you have to understand that in the non-Jewish world, horseradish is, um, you know, that the, uh, a, a, a greengrocer will stock, you know, a few bits of horseradish, not more than that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this, like, army of housewives are coming and they're making big orders for Pesach. You need lots of things, right? lots of potatoes, lots of lettuce. And they wanted horseradish as well. And uh, he wasn't really, he, he really wasn't geared up for this, and he ran out of horseradish. And uh, whatever, a lot of people were pretty upset about it all. Anyway, in all events, a couple of weeks later, my mother goes in to make her weekly order. And uh, the fellow, he says to her, Mrs. Lamfrey says, come, I want to show you something. And he takes her to the back room, to the storeroom, 
where all the, all the produce is that's not out, right? And he shows in the, in the middle of the store, on the floor, there's like a mountain of horseradish. And he said, he said, my mother said he was so pleased with himself. He said he found out there was another Jewish festival coming up mm-hmm. and he wasn't going to make any mistakes this time. Mm-hmm. And oh, he'd ordered, all right, he ordered all of the and horseradish that he could get. Horse. He'd ordered it all. <laughs> and my mother did not know what to do with herself. Because on the one hand, she didn't want to upset him. You know, he went to all this trouble and he's trying to help out the Jews over here. And, and then, she, right? But on the other hand, he, he couldn't let, he, she couldn't let him sell this stuff. Try, try selling this stuff to all the Jewish clients that come in, right? Here, yeah, can, I give you, can I give you a couple of kilos of horseradishes? You know, yeah, well, we only eat this stuff on Pesach. So she didn't know what to do. So in the end, my mother, who was like, she was like a real tzaddikus and she, you know, she didn't want to hurt anybody. So she bought, she bought tons of the stuff, masses of it. What did you do with it? It just, it just lay around in our garden shed for months <laughs> until my father finally threw it away. Anyway, in all events, just one, one last thing which is very, very important with regards to the Mara. And we'll finish with this for today, even though I told you we we're going to finish with that story. But I said something which was definitely not accurate. But uh, lettuce, lettuce is prone to bugs, mm. infestation. Oh. And it's absolutely vital. First of all, Baruch Hashem, today you can buy lettuce that is, has, it's got no, no bugs. It's not, gro- it's not grown in the ground. It doesn't have to be organic. Oh, oh hydroponic lettuce. Hydroponic lettuce. It's bug-free. It's been grown in very special ways. It comes already with a hechshar on it saying that it's bug-free. All you have to do is wash it off because it's a little bit sandy. Um, and you can, you, can, you can use that without having to check. If you're not going to do that, Bullet. checking lettuce is a real avoider. You've got to take the lettuce leaves, son, soak son. them, rinse them, hold them up to the light. I mean, it's, it's a great big and thing, it really something. is. One of my friend's fathers went out and bought himself, you know, you know the, the, the machines that they have, the, they stick the x-rays into, right? They stick oh. them in. He bought one of those to put on the table, and that's how he checked his, uh, how wow, he checked his lettuce like and his rice. Oh but it, it's like, it's a real, Baruch Hashem, today you don't, we don't have to do that, you really don't. You can just go out, it costs a little rice. bit more. Depends what rice you're using, but some rice comes in vacuum-packed packets that have got a heksha on them. Uh, other, other, other rice, if it doesn't have a heksha, it's got to be checked. Rice, rice that gets eaten for Pesach, anybody who eats Pesach, or anyone who eats Pesach on rice, or even rice on Pesach, needs to be checked three times. Why is that? Because it's not just a bug issue. It's, it's grains, right? You just, and the grains get mixed together. And you've got to get rid of all, everything except for the rice <coughs> has got to be taken out. And some, some, there are some Sephardi communities where they, don't, uh, where they don't eat rice on Pesach, they don't eat kidneys either. Uh, but for those that do, it's just something, you know, it's something that needs to be done. It's a, it's, a big, it's a big job, a real big job. In all events, it's worth paying a little bit more to get lettuce for the Seder yeah. that's been checked. No bugs, you don't have to worry about anything. And that way... You know, it saves an awful lot of energy. What it really do they does. Call that?